start the session now. Uh, hello guys, good morning and welcome you all in this uh, AI102 session. Thanks for joining. Myself, Archie this said, and I'm at host for the session, guys. If you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We will be there to help you out. Now, let's moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor. Uh, that is Synergetics. So, Synergetics is in India one of time supporting learning solution company. Now, you will get a question and uh, what we doing and what we answering. So, answering your question, we brush our offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to clients who wish to monetize their framework. We educate, advise, implement, and manage. Then, the Synergetics solution offering that is persona based onboarding solution. Onboarding add on solution, certification solution, certification add on, reskilling, emerging technology training solution, certification hackathon, cloud adoption, latest technology training solution, sales and pistons training, practice playbook, and architecture. Then, what this Microsoft certification training does? It will give you complete learning experience. You will gain, train, build confidence to appear for the exam and get certified. This is skilling journey. Here you can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification, then expert level certification. In fundamental level certification, we have Azure Fundamental, Azure AI Fundamental, Azure Data Fundamental, Power Platform Fundamental, and Security Compliance and Identity Fundamental. In associate level certification, we have many types of uh, certification. Here, here you can see on my screen. And expert level certification, we have AZ305, SC100, PL600, and AZ400. Also, we have special certification that is a uh, AZ120, AZ140, and AZ220. If you want any certification, you can connect with us. Then certification offering. So certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. And moving ahead, and today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So what ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Then Azure Tech community for Pune Kars. Then emerging technology community for Surat. Azure Tech community for Nagpur Kars. Guys, you just have to install the Meetup app and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct, uh, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. Uh, we will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Today's speaker for this training is uh, Ms. Smith Shah. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently works with Synergetics as a training consultant. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. You can read this agenda. In today's session, we are providing you AI102 Learning Achievement Batch. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated batch. Don't forget to subscribe on our official YouTube, uh, social media platform like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming event updates. Thank you, guys. Now I would like to hand over this mic. Our speaker, you will continue it. Thank you, Archie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to AI102 webinar. My name is Mitch Shah, and I will be your mentor for today. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, 
and on top of that, I'm an Azure certified AI engineer, a Azure certified data engineer, as well as a Azure certified data scientist. And I've been in the data and AI field since the last seven years, wherein I've trained multiple international as well as domestic lines, including LTI Mindry, Deloitte, Capgemini, and many, many more. So yeah, that's just a brief introduction about me. Now let's go ahead and let's start with our webinar. So let's first understand the agenda of today's webinar. So what are we going to cover today? So the first thing that we will learn is what is artificial intelligence? So you will have an overview of what artificial intelligence is. After that, we will go ahead and see the demos of various AI services that Azure offers. So first we will see the demo of Azure speech service. Then we will see the demo of Azure vision service. OK. After that, we will see the demo of Azure document intelligence service. After seeing the demo of Azure document intelligence service, we'll go ahead and we'll see the demo of Azure OpenAI service. So this will be our agenda for today's webinar. So let's first start by understanding what is AI. You guys might know that AI stands for artificial intelligence, but what is it? Let's go ahead and let's understand that. So if anybody asks you the definition of AI, you will say that AI is nothing but a set of tools used to get inferences through predictions. OK, that means it is nothing but a set of tools that is used to get insights from data by generating predictions. OK, by generating. Predictions. All right, so. Over here, we have seen the definition of AI. Now, looking at this definition, you might have a question that, OK, we know AI is a set of tools that is used to get inferences to predictions. But how do we get those inferences through predictions? Well, we get it by using something called a AI model. So this is a fancy term that is used in the market nowadays, right? AI model. But what is it? Let's try to understand. So I will show you the definition of an AI model. The definition will look complex at first, but don't worry, we will try to simplify it. So let's see the definition of an AI model. So guys, a AI model is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. Let's try to simplify this definition. In order to simplify it, I will take an example. Suppose I have information about some of the houses in my locality. So I have information about area of the house in square feet. And I also have information about the price of the house. So let's suppose the first house that I surveyed had a area of 100 square feet and the price of the house was 1 crore. The second house that I surveyed had an area of 200 square feet and the price of the house was 2 crore. Similarly, the third house that I surveyed had an area of 300 square feet and the price of the house was 3 crore. Now I have a question for each and every one of you. Let's suppose I have information about a fourth house. The area of that house is 350 square feet, but I don't know the price of that house. I want you guys to help me predict the price of this fourth house over here. So according to you, what do you predict could be the price of this fourth house? Yash has given me a prediction. Yash is mentioning that according to him, the price of this fourth house could be somewhere around 3.5 crore, right? Even Guna Shekhar has mentioned the same in the chat that according to him, the price of this house will be somewhere around 3.5 crore. So over here, you have given the correct answer, Yash and Guna Shekhar. But guys, can I say that in order to arrive at this prediction, you used some mathematics in your head, you used some statistics in your head. Can I say that? Yes or no? Yash, Guna Shekhar and Moria. You gave me the correct prediction, but in order to arrive at that prediction, you use some mathematics in your head. You use some statistics in your head. That's exactly what an AI model also does. 
uh, AIM also, uh, AI model also tries to use statistics or in other words, it also tries to use mathematics to simulate what would happen in the real world. Just like you guys tried to simulate the real price of the house by using mathematics or by using statistics. That's exactly what an AI model also does. It's just that currently the data in front of you was simple. That's why you applied simple mathematics. On the other hand, if the data was complex, you would have applied complex mathematics. Same applies to the AI model also. If it encounters a simple data, it will apply simple mathematics. If it sees complex data, then it will apply complex mathematics. Okay, so one thing is clear to us. We know what is uh, AI. We know that AI is nothing but a set of tools that is used to get inferences through predictions. But how do we get those inferences through predictions? We get it by using something called an AI model. What is an AI model? It is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. In simple words, we are trying to simulate a real world process by using some statistics or by using some mathematics. Now let's go ahead and learn. Let's learn about the two important notes that you need to remember before creating any AI model. The first important note that you need to remember is that for creating any AI model, you need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Okay. Now you might ask me that Smith, we have heard that we can create an AI model on image data as well. And image data is not in the form of rows and columns. Well, yes, you can create an AI model on image data, but even that image data behind the scenes will have to be converted into rows and columns. Okay, so the point that I'm making is whatever data you are going to use for creating an AI model has to be in the form of rows and columns. Okay, that was note number one. Note number two was that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. What is the difference between a feature column and a target column? Well, a feature column is a column that helps me to predict, whereas a target column is a column that I want to predict. So let's suppose um, I have my data with me. In that data, I have three columns, square feet column, city column and price column. Now I want to understand over here, which will be my feature column, which will be my target column. We know the difference between feature column and a target column. Feature column is that column that helps me to predict. Target column is that column that I want to predict. So let's suppose I want to predict on price. Then price will be which type of column guys? If I want to predict on price, then price will be which type of column? Can anyone answer it in the chat? Yes. Shubham has given the correct answer. You guys have correctly mentioned that if I want to predict on price, then price will be my target column. And since square feet and city help me to predict price, they will be called my feature columns. So I hope with this example, the difference between a feature column and a target column is clear to you. A feature column is a column that helps you to predict, whereas a target column is a column that you want to predict. Okay. Now, let's go ahead. And let's learn about the different approaches to create an AI model. So guys, there are two main approaches to create an AI model. First is the approach of machine learning. And second is the approach of deep learning. Okay, I repeat myself. There are two main approaches to create an AI model. First is the approach of machine learning. And second is the approach of deep learning. Let's have an overview of these two approaches. Okay, currently we will just have a simplistic overview of these two approaches. So in order to understand the overview, I always use this analogy of a knife and a machete. Let me use that analogy again so that you can understand the overview of these two approaches. The two approaches that I am talking about is the machine learning approach and the deep learning approach. In order to have a understanding of these two approaches, I always use this analogy of a knife and a machete. So machine learning is like using a knife, whereas deep learning is like using a machete. What do I mean by that? Let's try to understand. Okay. So now I will ask a simple question to you. Okay. Let me ask it to Shivendra. So Shivendra, let's suppose you want to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or an apple. 
in that scenario which tool will you use to cut that simple object will you use a knife or will you use a machete so shivendra has given the correct answer shivendra says that he will choose a knife okay so shivendra you have correctly mentioned that in order to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or apple you will use a knife on the other hand shivendra if you want to cut a complex object something like a coconut which tool will you use will you use a knife or will you use a machete if you want to cut a complex object something like a coconut which tool will you use a knife or a machete which tool will be ideal shivendra correctly mentions that he will use a machete so shivendra what you are mentioning is on a simple object you will use a knife whereas on a complex object you will use a machete let's apply the same analogy over here so guys on a simple data set we generally use the machine learning approach whereas on a complex data set we generally go for deep learning approach now when can i say that my data set is simple or complex well if the relationship between your feature and target column is simple that means your data set that you are working is a simple data set on the other hand if the relationship between your feature and target is complex then the data set that we are working on will be called a complex data set let me give you an example of a complex data set so let's suppose i am going to build a ai model uh, that is going to predict the sentiment of a person in the image so whether the person in the image is happy sad or neutral okay so let's suppose i have data for it so let's say i have a feature column and a target column now let's say in my feature column i have pixel values of images so in the first row i have pixel values of image 1 and correspondingly in the target column i have information about whether the person in that image was happy sad or neutral so let's say in image 1 the person was happy then similarly in the second row i have information about pixels values of image 2 okay you guys know that pixel values will be between 0 to 255 okay so let's have pixel values from um, or, or pixel values of image 2 and correspondingly in the target column i have information about whether the person in the image was happy sad or neutral so let's say in the second image the person was happy and so on okay so let's suppose i have data like that now i have a question for each and every one of you here looking at pixel values will you be able to figure out whether the person in that image was happy sad or neutral so for you as a human what do you think is this simple relationship or is this complex relationship let me put the question again okay so looking at pixel values of the image if i just show you the pixel values of the image pixel values will be between somewhere around 0 to 255 okay so if i show you pixel values of the image and if i ask you that now tell me whether the person in the image is happy sad or neutral will it be simple or complex simple okay then let me take a 3 by 3 image 3 pixels in width 3 pixels in height let's say over here i have pixel values between 0 to 255 okay So let's suppose I have pixel values over here between zero to two fifty five. Now looking at these pixel values, you tell me whether the person is happy, sad, or neutral. You won't be able to tell me, right? Because the relationship between pixel values, okay, which is my feature column by the way, and uh, the really the point that I'm making is currently the relationship between my feature column and my target column is complex. okay it's complex if i just show you the pixel values and ask you that okay now tell me whether the person in the image is happy sad or neutral it will be complex for you okay so over here this data set i would call it a complex data set and always on a, on a complex data set i will go for deep learning approach okay so if the data set is a simple data set go for machine learning approach on the other hand if the data set is a complex data set then go for deep learning approach okay fine now let's understand more differences between these two approaches 
So Shivendra, you had correctly mentioned one difference, right? Uh, so I had asked you a question. Uh, that in order to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or an apple, which tool will you use? A knife or a machete? And you had correctly answered knife. On the other hand, in order to cut a complex object like a coconut, which tool will you use? A knife or a machete? And you had correctly answered a machete. Okay. So, Shivendra, your answers were correct. But Shivendra, why did you give those answers? So, for, for example, uh, when I asked you that in order to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or apple, which tool will you use? A knife or a machete? You correctly answered knife. But why did you choose a knife? What were the reasons behind it? Can you give me those reasons? You give the apps, you give the correct answer. But what were the reasons behind it? Why did you choose a knife to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or a coconut? Why did you choose a knife? Can I say, Shivendra, one uh, um, a reason is that it is simple to use. So, oh yeah, Shivendra, I guess the comment that you have mentioned in the chat is indicating the same, right? That you chose a knife because it was simple to use. Right? It will be simple for you to use. On the other hand, for machete, you will have to be careful. You will have to be technically good to handle a machete. Correct or no, Shivendra? You chose a knife because it was simple to use. On the other hand, for a machete, you will need more technical uh, ability. Okay. Uh, you can't just give anyone a machete okay, because they might cut themselves. Okay. You need more uh, te um, technicalities for handling a machete. On the other hand, handling a knife is simple. So, Shivendra. Uh, in order to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or a coconut, you correctly said that you will use a knife. The reason being that one reason is that knife is simple to use. On the other hand, machete is complex to use. Similarly, guys, the machine learning approach is simple to implement. So if you want to create an AI model with the machine learning approach, it will be very simple for you. Okay, Even a person who is completely new to AI, will be able to create an AI model with the machine learning approach. It's that simple. On the other hand, if one wants to create an AI model with the deep learning approach, it will be more complex for him or her. Because in the deep learning approach, there are a lot of technicalities behind the scenes. Okay, So you need a technical person, uh, a much more technical person, to create an AI model using the deep learning approach. Okay. Whereas the machine learning approach is very, very simple. Okay, comparatively, it's very, very simple to implement. So creating an AI model with machine learning approach is very simple. Whereas creating an AI model using the deep learning approach will be slightly hard. It will be more complex for you. Okay, so that is another difference between these two approaches. Okay, let me ask Shivendra again. Shivendra, in order to cut a simple object like a potato or a tomato or a coconut, you correctly chose a knife. One reason was that it was simple to use. What was the second reason? So let me put the question in this manner. Let's suppose you have moved to a new city for your work. And now uh, you want to make sure that you have all the uh, cutting tools in your kitchen. Okay. So um, you are trying to buy uh, a cutting tool from the market. So which cutting tool will you buy? A knife or a machete for your day-to-day -day usage, which cutting tool will you buy? A knife or a machete? You will probably buy a knife. One reason was that it was simple to use. Second main reason is that knife is more cheaper. Right? Knife is more cheaper. That's another second reason. Similarly, guys, if you create an AI model with the machine learning approach, then in the machine learning approach, you have comparatively less number of mathematical computations happening behind the scenes. And since you have less number of mathematical computations, because of that, your computation cost will be low. Nowadays, guys, companies use cloud platforms to perform their computations. Okay, And in cloud platforms, the more computations you do, the more money you have to pay. So the point that I'm making is, if you create an AI model using the machine learning approach, then machine learning approach has comparatively less number of mathematical computations because of which your computation cost will be low. Okay, Whereas the deep learning approach has comparatively more number of mathematical computations because of which your computation cost will be high. All right. 
Now, one last question to each and every one of you. A general question. Fine. You're using that same analogy of a knife and a machete. So, guys, if I just talk about cutting efficiency, okay, just cutting efficiency, which tool will be more sharp for cutting? A knife or a machete? Just cutting efficiency. I'm just talking about cutting efficiency. Which tool will be more sharp in cutting? A knife or a machete? Which tool has a better cutting efficiency? A knife or a machete? Which tool will be more sharper? Can I say machete, right? As your Shivendra, Ganashri, everybody has given the correct answer. In terms of cutting efficiency, machete will be more efficient than a knife. Okay, machete is more uh, sharper than a knife. Okay. So similarly, guys, if you create an AI model using the deep learning approach, it will be more efficient. Okay. Deep learning approach is more efficient. So an AI model you created using deep learning approach will most probably give you better accuracy in terms of predictions. Okay. It will be more efficient in making predictions. The predictions will be comparatively more accurate. Whereas if you create an AI model using the deep learn, uh, sorry, if you create an AI model using the machine learning approach, then comparatively uh, it will be less efficient. Okay. So the accuracy in terms of predictions will be comparatively less. The accuracy will be less. Okay. That's what is generally observed. Okay. Fine. So using this analogy of a knife and a machete, we have tried to have a simplistic overview of both of these approaches. Guys, did the simplistic overview make sense to each and every one of you? Did it make sense? Over here, we have just covered the simplistic overview. Nothing else. I hope the simplistic overview made sense. Okay. So now just to recap, if I talk about the advantages of machine learning, one advantage is that machine learning is more simple to implement. So even a person who is completely new to the AI field, he or she can create an AI model using the machine learning approach. So that's one benefit, which is that machine learning is most simple to implement. Second benefit is that machine learning approach will lead to less computation cost because comparatively machine learning approach has lesser mathematical computations happening because of which the computation cost will be low. So over here, two main advantages of machine learning are mentioned. But what about the disadvantages of machine learning? One major disadvantage of machine learning is that machine learning approach is only good enough for simple data sets. As soon as the data set becomes complex, machine learning approach doesn't work well on it. Okay. So machine learning approach is only good enough on a simple data set. But for a complex data set, machine learning approach might not work. Okay. Second disadvantage of machine learning is that machine learning approach is comparatively less efficient as compared to the deep learning approach. So if you create an AI model using the machine learning approach, it might give you comparatively less accuracy in terms of model predictions as compared to the deep learning approach. Okay. So your every approach has its own advantages and disadvantages. Okay. So I hope the simplistic overview of machine learning approach and deep learning approach is clear to you. Fine. Now let's go ahead. Uh, and now what we'll do is we will go ahead and learn about the different types of AI models. So guys, there are many, many types of AI models. In fact, after eight to 10 months, a new type of AI model comes into the market. But today we will look into two types of AI models only because 95% of the work done in the AI industry is done on these two types. So let's go ahead and let's study them. So the first type of AI model that I'm going to talk about is called supervised learning model. The second type of AI model that I'm going to talk about is called unsupervised learning model. What is the difference between the two? Well, a supervised learning model is a model wherein the data that you are using has features and target both. Whereas a unsupervised learning model is a model wherein the data that you are using only has features, but it does not have target. Then supervised learning models were further divided into two types. First is classification model. Second is regression model. What is the difference between the two? Well, a classification model is a model wherein the target column has finite set of possibilities. Whereas a regression model is a model 
wherein the target column has infinite set of possibilities. Let's understand the difference between a classification model and a regression model with the help of an example. So let's suppose I have a column with me called dice roll. Wherein what I'm doing is I'm playing a game of dice with my friends and whatever value I get after rolling the dice, that value I'm storing it in this column. So let's say when I first roll my dice, I get the value four. Again, when I roll my dice, I get the value six. Again, when I roll my dice, I get the value one. Again, when I roll my dice, I get the value six again and so on. So let's suppose dice roll column is my target column. So now my question to you is in the dice roll column, how many different possible values can I have? Or let me put the question in a different way. When I roll my dice, how many possible values can I get? When I roll my dice, how many possible values can I get? How many guys? Six, right? When I roll my dice, I have six possible values that I can get. As Shivendra and Gunashekar have mentioned, that when I roll my dice, I have six possible values to get. Either I can get the value one, two, three, four, five, or six. Apart from these six possibilities, I have nothing else. So in dice roll column, I have six possibilities. Or in other words, in dice roll column, I have finite set of possibilities. And since dice roll column is my target column, that means in my target column, I have finite set of possibilities. So if your target column has finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification model. Let's take another example. Let's suppose I have a column with me called gender, wherein I'm storing the gender value of every employee in my office. Let's say the first employee in my office has a gender of male. The next employee has a gender of female. The next employee has a gender of female again and so on. So let's assume that gender column is your target column. So now in the gender column, do we have finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities? Of course, finite set of possibilities. So if gender column is your target column and if in your target column you have finite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a classification model. Let's take one more example. Suppose I have a column with me called uh, stock price, wherein I'm mentioning the price of my stock after every day. So let's say on the first day, the price of the stock was 100.984 rupees. On the next day, it was 99.2 rupees. On the third day, it was 99.31 rupees and so on. So let's assume that stock price column is my target column. So over here in my target column, do I have finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities? Of course, infinite set of possibilities because my stock price could be anything. It could be $99.111. It could be $10.45. It could be $20.467, anything. So your stock price column has infinite set of possibilities. If stock price column was my target column, that means my target column has infinite set of possibilities. And if my target column has infinite set of possibilities, then your model will be called a regression model. With this, we have covered basics of AI. So guys, did basics of AI make sense to everyone? I will do a quick revision just to recap it for you. So guys, first we started by understanding what is AI. So we said that AI is nothing but a set of tools that is used to get inferences through predictions. But how do we get those inferences through predictions? We get it by using something called an AI model. What is an AI model? It's nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process. In simple words, we are trying to simulate a real world process using some statistics or using some mathematics. Then we learned about the two important notes that we need to remember before creating an AI model. First important note is that for making any AI model, you need some data and that data needs to have some rows and some columns. Second important note is that the columns in the data will be of one of the two types. Either a column will be called a feature column or a column will be called a target column. Feature columns are those columns that help me to predict, whereas target column is that column that I want to predict. So if I want to predict on price, then price will be my target column. And since square feet and city help me to predict price, then they will be called my feature columns. After that, we looked into the two different approaches to create an AI model. So we saw the uh, approaches of machine learning and deep learning, and we tried to have a simplistic overview of these two approaches. 
so what are the advantages of machine learning approach one major advantage of machine learning is that creating a ai model with machine learning approach is much more simple okay comparatively very simple uh, second advantage of machine learning is that machine learning approach has lesser computation cost but what is the disadvantage of machine learning disadvantage is that machine learning approach is only good enough for simple data sets but as soon as the data set becomes complex machine learning approach might not work well that is one advantage sorry that is one disadvantage okay second disadvantage of machine learning is that machine learning approach is comparatively less efficient okay so uh, it uh, that means that as far as accuracy in predictions is concerned it will be comparatively less accurate okay fine so that is another disadvantage on the other hand if i talk about deep learning what are the advantages of deep learning so deep learning can be even used for complex data sets okay it can even be used for complex data sets so that is one big advantage second big advantage is that deep learning approach will always be be more efficient okay it will give you better accuracy in terms of model predictions it will always be more efficient in making predictions that is second advantage but what are the disadvantages one major disadvantage of deep learning approach is that it's complex to implement okay uh so you need a much more technical person to create a uh ai model using deep learning approach the second disadvantage of deep learning approach is that uh, it will lead to more computation cost okay so computation cost will be high so you can see each one of these two approaches have their own advantages and disadvantages okay after that we will uh, try to understand the different type of ai models so there are many many type of ai models however we only focused on these two types because more than 95% of the work done in the ai industry is done on these two types only so the first type that we talked about was supervised learning model second type that we talked about was unsupervised learning model what is the difference between the two a supervised learning model is a model wherein the data that i am using has features and target both a unsupervised learning model is a model wherein the data that i am using only has feature columns but it does not have target column after that we learned that supervised learning models are further divided into two types first is classification model second is regression model what is the difference between the two well a classification model is a model wherein the target column has finite set of possibilities whereas a regression model is a model wherein the target column has infinite set of possibilities with this we completed basics of ai so guys again i want to confirm with everyone did basics of ai make sense to you up till now clear yes or no yes gavin okay fine so now let's go ahead and let's see how to work with these ai models okay we'll go ahead and we'll understand how to work with these ai models now i just want to ask you so guys in ai 102 you are only going to work with ready made ai models okay so you will not be creating any ai model from scratch in ai 102 okay so this entire certification of ai 102 is all about working with ready made ai models but do you want to see how to create a custom ai model also i just want to ask you or should i directly proceed with ai 102 curriculum okay ganeshri and gavin are saying it will be better if we create if we understand how to create a custom ai models okay so let's see that okay although uh, it's not the new ai 102 curriculum but let's see that so we will have a idea okay because ai 102 is all about dealing with ready made ai models okay you guys will not create ai models in ai 102 so ai mod, uh, ai 102 is all about dealing with ready made ai models but how would you create a custom ai model let's try to understand that first has requested by you okay so guys what we will do is um we'll try to create a custom ai model so let's suppose i have some data with me of emails okay let's suppose i have some data with me of emails okay and using that data i want to predict whether a email is a normal email or a spam email now guys in your uh, email engines 
whether it's a gmail engine or a outlook engine each one of those engines what do they do internally they automatically try to predict whether the email that you are receiving is a normal email or a spam email right so internally some ai model is working let's suppose if you want to create a ai model like that how would you do it let's try to understand okay so let's suppose i have a feature column and a target column now let's suppose in my feature column i have information about a text of different emails so in my first row i have text of email 1 okay whatever is that text and correspondingly in the target column i have information about whether that email was normal or spam so let's suppose the first email was normal then let's suppose in the second row you have text of second email and that second email was a spam email let's suppose in the third row you had text of uh let's uh, let's suppose in the third row you had text of third email and the third email was a normal email and so on okay so let's suppose you have data of emails over here uh, so in this data let's suppose total you have information about 12 emails out of the 12 emails eight emails belong to normal category and four emails belong to spam category let's assume okay so this is my data that i'm working on using this data i want to create a ai model that will predict whether a email is a normal one or a spam one so i am going to create a ai model what is a ai model do a ai model is nothing but a statistical representation of a real world process that means in simple words we'll try to use statistics or we'll try to use mathematics to simulate what would happen in the real world so in order to create a ai model you can create your own statistical algorithm for example when i showed you this data guys when i showed you this data okay i had shown you a data wherein you had square feet column and price column and i had asked you to make predictions if you guys remember i had asked you to make predictions okay and you guys had correctly made predictions i had asked you to predict that okay if we have this uh, house whose square feet is 350 square feet what will be its price you guys had predicted the price will be 3.5 crores so in order to arrive at this prediction you created your own statistical algorithm in your mind okay so just like that in real world also you can create your own statistical algorithm or you can use some statistical algorithm readily available in the market let's look at one such statistical algorithm readily available in the market called multinomial naive bayes so this algorithm called multinomial naive bayes is based on naive bayes formula which was developed in the 1970s okay so around 50 years back so this is a very simplistic algorithm but since this is your first statistical algorithm um uh let's cover a simplistic one only there are much better algorithms than this okay uh, so i am not covering this algorithm because it's the best one no i am covering it because it's the most simple one okay and since this is and since this is your first algorithm that you are starting with let's start with a simple one only although there are much better algorithms that have come apart from this okay but let's talk about this algorithm i repeat myself we are going to create a ai model that will predict whether a email is a normal email or a spam email for that i can create my own statistical algorithm or i can use a statistical algorithm readily available in the market let's look at one such statistical algorithm readily available in the market called multinomial naive bayes and using that statistical algorithm i am going to make a ai model that will predict whether a email is a normal one or a spam one so let's first deal with normal emails so what i have done over here based on based on count of words okay based on count of unique words in normal emails we have created a histogram so this diagram that you see on your screen is a histogram so based on count of unique words in normal emails i have created this histogram so as for the diagram it seems that the word dear is occurring eight times in normal emails 
Similarly, as per the diagram, it seems that the word friend is occurring five times in normal emails. Similarly, as per the diagram, it seems that the word lunch is occurring three times in normal emails. And similarly, as per the diagram, it seems like the word money is occurring one time in normal emails. Okay, so based on count of words, count of unique words in normal emails, we have created a histogram. Although, guys, in reality, there will be thousands of unique words in normal emails. Okay, in real world. But here, just to keep the example simple, I have only considered four unique words. First unique word was dear. Second unique word was friend. Third unique word was lunch. Fourth unique word was money. Just to keep the example simple. Although in real world, there could be thousands of unique words in your normal emails. Okay. So what we have done based on count of unique words in normal emails, we have created this histogram. Now what I will do is I will calculate probability of each of these words occurring in normal emails. So what will be probability of the word dear occurring in normal email? So the word dear is occurring eight times in my normal emails, right? It is occurring eight times in my normal emails. So I will mention eight, then I will divide it by the total number of words. So what are the total number of words in my normal emails? The word dear is occurring eight times. The word friend is occurring five times. The word lunch is occurring three times. And the word money is occurring one time. So eight plus five plus three plus one, that will give me a value of 17. So the total number of words in normal emails are equal to 70. So probability of obtaining dear in a normal email will be 8 by 70. Okay. Similarly, guys. Okay. Similarly, can you tell me the probability of obtaining the uh, word friend in a normal email? What will be the probability? What will be the probability? The probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email. Dharampal has given the correct answer. Dharampal says it will be 5 by 70. And Dharampal is absolutely right. It will be 5 by 70. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word lunch in a normal email will be 3 by 17. And probability of obtaining the word money in a normal email will be 1 by 17. Now, just like I have dealt with normal emails, let me go ahead and let me deal with spam emails. So based on count of unique words in spam emails, I have created this histogram. So it seems that the word dear is occurring two times in spam email. The word friend is occurring one time in spam email. The word lunch is occurring zero times in spam email. And the word money is occurring four times in spam email. So let's go ahead and let's calculate probability of each of the words occurring in spam emails. So the probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email will be two divided by total number of words. So your total number of words is equal to seven, right? So the probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email will be two by seven. Similarly, probability of obtaining the word friend in a spam email will be one by seven. Probability of obtaining the word lunch in a spam email will be zero by seven. And similarly, probability of obtaining the word money in a spam email will be four by seven. Okay, it will be four by seven. Okay, so just like this, I'll go ahead and calculate their probabilities. Now, let's go ahead and let me ask you a question. So guys, overall in my data set, I had data of 12 emails, out of which 8 were normal. So guys, can you tell me probability of obtaining normal emails in my data set? What will be the probability of obtaining normal emails in my data set? Ganashri, Deepa, Dharampal, anyone? Okay, Ganeshri says probability will be 8 by 12. Perfect. Similarly, probability of obtaining spam emails in my data set, it will be 4 by 12, right? Okay. So same answer that Ganeshri has given in the chat, same will be mentioned in the slide also. That probability of obtaining a normal email is 8 by 12 and probability of obtaining a spam email is 4 by 12. Okay. So 90% of the algorithm has been completed. Now, Let's use the algorithm to make predictions. So suppose I have an email that I have received and in the, in the email I have only two words, dear friend. Although in a real world or email would have lots of words, but let's take a simple example. Let's suppose in my email I have only received these two words, dear friend. Now I want to predict whether this email is a normal email or a spam email. So how would I do it? Let's try to understand. So first what I will do is, 
I will calculate probability of that email belonging to normal category. Then I will calculate the probability of that email belonging to spam category. Whichever probability is higher, I will say that this email belongs to that particular category. So let's do that. So let's calculate probability of this email belonging to normal category. So I will have probability of obtaining normal emails in my data set multiplied by probability of obtaining the word dear in a normal email multiplied by probability of obtaining the word friend in a normal email. I'll just substitute the probability values and these probability values uh, when I substitute the probability values in this equation, the equation at the end gives me a output of 0 0.09. So probability of this email belonging to normal category is 0 0.09. Similarly, guys, similarly, let's calculate probability of this email belonging to spam category. So I will have probability of obtaining spam emails into probability of obtaining the word dear in a spam email into probability of obtaining the word friend in a spam email. I'll just substitute the probability values in this equation and at the end this equation will output a value of 0 0.01. So that means the probability of this email belonging to spam category is 0 0.01. Now have a look guys, since this algorithm is based on knife based formula, knife based formula was developed in around 1970s, around 50 years back. And in knife based formula, yes, you will get probability values but the probability values will not sum up to one. Whereas in the new age probability formulas, you would have observed that the probability values will sum up to one. So for example, if you want to calculate probability of India winning or Australia winning, let's say probability of India winning is 0 0.6. Probability of Australia winning is 0 0.4. Okay. If you sum up the probability is 0 0.6 plus 0 0.4, they sum up to one. Whereas this algorithm called multinomial naive base is based on naive base formula. Yes, naive base formula will give you probability values, but uh, it's not necessary that they sum up to one. But regardless of that, we can still use it. So over here, now you tell me guys, what uh, uh, this email, uh, I've calculated probability of this email belonging to a normal category. The probability was 0.09. Then I've calculated probability of this email belonging to spam category. The probability was 0 0.01. Guys, which probability is higher? This email belonging to normal category or this email belonging to spam category? Which one is higher? Which one is higher? Which probability is higher? This email belonging to normal category or this email belonging to spam category? Ganeshri says that this email belonging to normal category, uh, the probability of this email belonging to normal category is higher. Same is mentioned by Gana Shekhar and uh, Anirudh, right? Okay. So that's why I will make a prediction at the end. As per my prediction, this email will be a normal email. So that's how multinomial naive base goes ahead and makes predictions on the data. Okay. But guys, this is a very simplistic algorithm. Uh, there are much, much better algorithms than this. Okay. That are available in the market. Uh, but fine, um, I just wanted to prove you that um, you can even create a AI model out of this simplistic algorithm. Now that we have seen the theory of this algorithm, let's go ahead and let's implement it. Okay. Now that we have seen the theory, let's go ahead and let's implement it. So in order to implement it, I will you open a coding tool and uh, the coding tool that I'm opening is Jupyter Notebook. So it's opening currently in the background. Okay, now it has opened. So the coding tool that I'm using is Jupyter Notebook. You can use any coding tool that you like. I'm going to write code in Python programming language. So whichever coding tool supports Python programming language can be used by you. Okay, fine. So let me create a new file over here. And in that file, I will write my code. So what I'm going to do now is, now that we have seen the theory of multinomial naive base, we are going to implement it. So let's see how to implement a supervised learning AI model. Okay, so what are these steps? So the first step is to make sure that data is clean. Okay, by clean, I mean that data should not have 
any spelling mistakes okay it should not have any spelling mistakes it should not have any missing values okay it should not have any missing values and so on so that is the first step second step is to make sure that you extract the features and targets separately okay second step is to make sure that you extract the features and targets separately third step is to make sure that your features are of numeric nature your features should be of numeric nature that means you should have numeric feature columns what if you have non numeric feature column well that non numeric feature column has to be converted to numeric feature column how to do it i will show that to you okay then the fourth step is to make sure that features should have some rows and some columns now this might seem like a very basic step but it's not basic okay it might seem to you that i can even ignore this step no i will show you a scenario where this particular point will not satisfy and because of that what are the errors that you will face going forward you will see it so it's not a point that you should take lightly don't skip it okay that's what i mean to say okay all the points that i am mentioning over here um, should be implemented you should not skip any step okay then the fifth step is to make sure that you split the data into two parts training and testing training and testing then the sixth step is to make sure that features should be on the same scale by same scale i mean it should have same range of values okay but guys this should only be done on algorithms this should only be done on algorithms where there will be a calculation of distance using feature column values in our algorithm the one that we studied which was multinomial naive based was there involvement of calculating distance whatsoever no in none of these steps did we calculate any distance whatsoever that's why for our algorithm multinomial naive base step number 6 will be ignored okay fine moving on to the next step in the next step you have to make sure that you train the model on the training data set and then in the eighth step you will make sure that you test the model on the testing data set okay so let's go ahead and let's create a ai model but for creating a ai model i will need some data right so let's go ahead and let's uh, get that data so i have data of some of the tweets that were written by donald trump and justin trudeau okay so let me use that data i have data of some of the tweets that were written by donald trump and justin trudeau let me get that data okay here is my data all right uh, now guys over here if you observe the last column contains information about different tweets okay whereas the second last column contains information about the author of the tweet here in the author column there are only two possibilities either donald trump or justin trudeau so let's suppose author column is my target column now i want to ask a question to you okay let's suppose author column is my target column and tweets column is my feature column now i want to ask a question to you guys in the author column there are only two possibilities currently either donald trump or justin trudeau okay so that uh, let's say author column is my target column so if in my target column i have only two possibilities donald trump and justin trudeau then my model my supervised learning model will be of which type classification or regression my question to each and every one of you if my target column has two possibilities over here or in other words if my target column has finite set of possibilities then my model my supervised learning model will be of which type classification or regression dharampal vishwanathan vinod everybody has given the correct answer it will be a classification model 
So let's suppose I want to build a tweet for classification model uh, that can predict whether the tweet is written by Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau. How to do that? Let's see. So the first step I will implement over here. In the first step, I will make sure that data is clean. It should not have any spelling mistakes. It should not have any missing values and so on. Let's look at missing values first. Let me see if I have any missing values in my data. On checking, I encounter that the first column has zero missing values, second column has zero missing values, third column has zero missing values, and even the fourth column has zero missing values. So that's good. I do not have any missing values in my data. What about spelling mistakes? I've already checked for spelling mistakes earlier. My data does not have any spelling mistakes, so that's good news. With this, step number one has been done by me. Now, moving on to step number two, which is to make sure that we extract the features and targets separately. So let's go ahead and let's do that. Let's extract the features and targets separately. So here, guys, the last column will be my feature column. And the second last column will be my target column. Okay. So let's extract them separately. So my last column will be my feature column. And the second last column, which is this author column, will be my target column. OK, with this step number two has been done. We wanted to extract features and targets separately, and I have done that. Now step number three is to make sure that features should be of numeric nature. So let's go ahead and check if the features are of numeric nature or not. So guys, I have only one feature column, right? I have only one feature column and have a look at it. That one feature column itself is non-numeric. I have only one feature column and that too is non-numeric. So if I have a non-numeric feature column, then what to do? Let's try to understand. Okay, let's see. So if I have a non-numeric feature column, then what will I do? Let's try to understand. So I'll just uh, mention a guide that you can follow over here. So guys, if you have a non-numeric feature column with you, then first you need to check whether that non-numeric feature column is it discrete in nature or is it continuous in nature? Okay. Is it discrete in nature? Or is it continuous in nature? By discrete in nature, I mean a column having finite set of possibilities. By continuous in nature, I mean a column having infinite set of possibilities. So first you need to check whether that non-numeric feature column is of discrete in, discrete nature or continuous nature. If it is of discrete nature, then you can use any one out of these two techniques. You can either use one out encoding technique or you can either use dummy encoding technique. Or you can either use dummy encoding technique. Okay, then. Uh, let's suppose you have a non-numeric feature column is continuous in nature. Then again, you have two techniques that you can choose from. You can either go for count vectorizer technique or you can either go for TF IDF vectorizer technique. TF IDF vectorizer technique. Okay, so let's try to investigate guys whether my non-numeric feature column is discrete in nature or continuous in nature. Have a look at my non-numeric feature column. Does it have finite set of possibilities or does it have infinite set of possibilities? My question to you is, have a look at my non-numeric feature column. Does it have finite set of possibilities or infinite set of possibilities? Deepak says infinite set of possibilities, right? So that means my non-numeric feature column is continuous in nature. If it is continuous in nature, I have two approaches to choose from, either count vectorizer or TF-IDF vectorizer. Let's start with count vectorizer first. Let's see how that works. Okay. So I will first show you how count vectorizer works. So let me show you how it works. I'll just give a heading over here, count vectorizer. And let's see how it works. So let's suppose I have information about some tweets. 
OK, let's suppose I have information about some tweets. In the first row, I have a tweet mentioning that a uh, cricket is. A good sport. In the second tweet, somebody has written is uh, somebody has mentioned a tweet saying that sport of cricket. Is a. Exciting sport. Now, how will I convert this non numeric feature column to a numeric feature column by using count vectorizer? Let's see. So in count vectorizer, what are the steps? Let's go ahead and let's understand the steps. First step is to find out. The unique OK, find out the number of unique words in the non numeric feature column. Second step is to create a new column. For every unique word. OK, for every unique word. Third step is to fill the values. In the column. Based on. Count of. That unique word. OK, fine. So let's see how these steps work. First step that I've mentioned is to find out the number of unique words in the non numeric feature column. So here, let's see how many unique words we have. So cricket is a unique word. Is is another unique word. A is another unique word. Good is another unique word. Sport is another unique word. What about the next word? This word? No, it's not unique. It has already occurred previously. What about this word called off? Yes, it's a unique word. What about this word called cricket? No, it has already occurred previously, so it's not unique. What about this word called is? It has already occurred previously, so it is not unique. What about this word called a? It has already occurred previously, so it's not unique. What about this word called exciting? Yes, it's a unique word. What about this word called sport? It has already occurred previously, so it's not unique. So if I count the number of unique words, I observe that there are seven unique words. Okay. So step number one has been done. Dharampal says, what about the order? Dharampal here, the order doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter whatsoever. OK, irrespective of the order, you will count the number of unique words. OK, order doesn't matter over here whatsoever. So first step has been done by me. I found out the number of unique words and Dharampal. I found out that there are seven unique words up till your Dharampal clear. That there are seven unique words in my non numeric feature column up till your Dharampal clear. Yes, OK. Now, second step is to create a new column for every unique word. So let's do that. Let's create a new column for every unique word. So first unique word is cricket. So I'll create a column for it. Second unique word is called is. So I'll create a column for that. Third unique word is a. So I'll create a column for that. Fourth unique word is good, so I'll create a column for that. Fifth unique word is sport, so I'll create a column for that. Sixth unique word is off, so I'll create a column for that. Seventh unique word is exciting, so I'll create a column for that. Okay, fine. Then third and last step is to fill the values of that column based on the count of those unique words. Okay, so let's do that. So guys, in the first row, the word cricket is occurring how many times? One time. So I'll mention a count of one. In the first row, the word is is occurring how many times? One time. So I'll mention a count of one. In the first row, the word a is occurring how many times? One time. So I'll mention a count of one. In the first row, the word good is occurring how many times? One time. So I'll mention a count of one. In the first row, the word sport is occurring how many times? One time. So I'll mention a count of one. But let me ask this question to you guys. Guys, in the first row, the word off is occurring how many times? In the first row, the word off is occurring how many times? In the first row of my non numeric feature column, the word off is occurring how many times? As Anirudh mentions, zero times, right? So I'll mention a count of zero exactly like Anirudh has mentioned. Then in the first row, the word exciting is occurring how many times? Zero times. Coming to the second row now. In the second row, the word cricket is occurring how many times? One time. In the second row, the word is is occurring how many times? One time. In the second row, the word a is occurring how many times? One time. 
in the second row the word good is occurring how many times zero times in the second row the word sport is occurring how many times two times so i'll mention a count of two in the second row the word off is occurring how many times one time in the second row the word exciting is occurring how many times one time and with this i have completed the steps of count vectorizer and have a look guys have i converted the non numeric values to numeric values have we done that or no in the process we have ended up with more columns than what we had before but that's fine at least my non numeric values have been converted to numeric values so guys this is how count vectorizer converts non numeric feature values to numeric feature values in the process we end up with more feature columns than what we had before but that's fine for us over here so deepak dharampal anirudh everyone did count vectorizer make sense is it clear how it works i hope it's clear yes okay fine so now let's go ahead and let's try to implement it okay now that we have seen the theory of count vectorizer let's implement it so in order to implement it i'll need help of a python class which i will import from sql on folder there is a file uh, there is a another sub folder called feature extraction inside that sub folder i have a file called text and from that file i will import my class called count vectorizer this is the class that will help me to implement the count vectorizer technique now let me go ahead and let me call the class for those who are completely new to python you can think of this like waking up the count vectorizer technique by writing this code the count vectorizer technique will wake up and once it has woken up we'll ask it to perform its job okay so i will use this method called fit underscore transform here what does the term fit mean fit in modeling uh, terms it basically means scanning okay so it will scan the data find out how many unique words we have based on the unique words it will create that many columns and then it will transform the non numeric values to numeric values right so i'm using this method called fit underscore transform okay and uh, here i will apply count vectorizer on my feature column okay let me apply it on my feature column we know how count vectorizer works um yes in the process we might end up with more columns than what we have before but that's fine okay so what count vectorizer uh, does is depending on the number of unique words it creates that many columns so if there are five unique words it will create five columns if there are 500 unique words it will create 500 new columns if there are 2000 unique words it will create 2000 uh, new columns and so on okay with this step number 3 has been done moving on to step number 4 moving on to step number 4 which is to make sure that features have some rows and some columns so let me check whether they have some rows and some columns or not and yes they do have some rows and some columns so that's fine then the fifth step is to make sure that we split the data set into two parts training and testing so let's go ahead and let's split the data set into two parts over here training and testing in order to do that i'll need help of a function that i will import from sql on folder there is a file called model selection from that file i will import this python function called train test split so let me go ahead and let me call that function the first thing that i'll do is i'll pass my features the next thing that i'll do is i'll pass my target after that i will mention the ratio in which i want to divide my data into training and testing so let's suppose 20% of the overall rows i want in testing data set the remaining 80% of the rows i want in training data set okay but by the way you might have a doubt why are we splitting the data set into two parts let's try to understand that first okay so let me take a scenario okay so i will try to make you understand why do we split the data set into two parts training and testing okay why just we can't keep it as a single part why do we have to split it into two let's try to understand so let's suppose we have anirudh with us anirudh is a principal of a school let's suppose and anirudh is, will be responsible for um let's say uh what was that example that i was giving i forgot that example so i was taking that principal example and yes i wanted to prove to you that why do we split the data into training and testing okay fine 
So Anirudh, let's suppose you are the principal of a school and you are the one responsible for creating question papers for the students. Okay. So let's say students are studying on their textbook. Okay. Students are studying on their textbook. Now Anirudh, my one question to you is, you want to ensure that you can judge the student's knowledge. Okay. So you will design the question papers accordingly so that you can judge the student's knowledge better. So now when you will design the question papers, will you pass questions that are inside the textbook or will you pass questions of the same concepts but outside the textbook? What will you do? How will you be better able to judge the students? By passing questions that are inside the textbook or by passing questions that are related to the concepts in the textbook but they are outside of the textbook? Anirudh says inside the textbook. Okay. But Anirudh, is it possible that the students might mug up the answer? Right? In India, we have this habit, right, of mugging up the answers. So it there's a possibility, right, Anirudh, that the students might mug up the answers without actually understanding the concept. They will just mug up the question and answer. And if a same question is asked in uh, uh, in the question paper that is that was inside the textbook, they will just vomit that answer in the question uh, in, in the answer sheet. Okay. So the danger, Anirudh, uh, with the approach that you have suggested is: Can I say the students might might mug up the answers for those questions? And if you ask the question that was already inside the textbook, they have already mugged up the answer. So they will just vomit the answer in the answer sheet. Okay. So. With this, you are not able to come to know whether the student's knowledge is good or not. Okay, maybe the student has entered a correct answer, but maybe the student has entered a correct answer because the student has mugged up the answer without actually understanding the concept. So, can I say, Anirudh, in order to better better judge the students, you should ask a question that was outside of the textbook? Yes or no? The question that you are asking will be similar to the concepts that are mentioned inside the textbook, but it will be outside of the textbook. Okay, it's like for example, let's say it's an MCQ test. Okay, and students are studying MCQs from their textbook. If you ask an MCQ that's already inside the textbook, the student has probably mugged up the answers for the MCQs. So the student will just vomit that answer. Okay, so even though the student has mentioned the right answer, but you will not come to know whether the student has actually understood the concept or not. So the point that I'm making is you should ask questions that are outside the textbook. You should test on questions that the student has not trained on. Okay. You should test on questions that student has not trained on. Okay. So suppose if we have some data like this, um, let's say I have a column called number of certifications and gender column. Let's say number of certifications is my feature column and gender column is my target column. So let's say with one certification, the person in my employee, the, the person in, uh, in my office was a male employee. With two certifications, the person was again a male employee. With one certification, again, the person was a male employee. Okay, but with eight certifications, the person who, that was there in my company was a female employee. With nine certifications, the person in my company was a female employee and so on. Now what I'll do is I'll split this data into two parts, training and testing. Some rows could go into training data set. The remaining rows could go into training uh, testing data set. Remember the selection of rows into training and testing will be random. Okay, but let's suppose in random selection, what happened was first three rows went into training, the remaining two rows went into testing. So now what will you will do is you will train the model on the training data set. Remember, each row of the training data set acts as an example for the model. So here I'm passing three examples to the model to train on. So the model will be trained on three rows of the training data set, or the model will be trained on three examples of the training data set. Once the model has completed its training, then we'll ask the model. Uh, then we'll judge the performance of the model on the testing data set. We'll test the model on the testing data set. So we'll ask the model, okay, that, okay, take the first row of the testing data set where feature column value is eight. Give me the target column value of that particular row. Okay, so it, it might predict target column value as something like male. Okay, similarly, you will show these uh, feature value of the second row in the testing data set, and you will ask the model to make the prediction. Okay, remember during prediction, the target column values will be hidden. 
Okay, so you'll only show them the feature column values and ask the model to get the prediction. Okay, so you will ask the model that okay, in the second row, feature column value is nine. For that, make the prediction. Maybe the model makes a prediction of female. So here there were two rows in the testing data set. Out of two rows, only for one row, correct prediction was made. So my accuracy will be one divided by two. Okay, so accuracy formula is number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions. Number of correct predictions was done for one row. Total number of predictions was two, right? In the testing data set, predictions were made for two rows. So class uh, accuracy formula will be number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions. In this scenario, my accuracy will be one divided by two, which is 0 0.5. In percentage terms, I can say that my model was 50% accurate on my testing data set. Okay. So this is the reason of dividing the data into training and testing. The idea is that same rows that we had in training should not occur in testing. Okay. So we want different rows for training and testing. All right, fine. Uh, so uh, here I'm using this function called train test split to divide the data into training and testing. First I've passed my features, then I've passed my target. Then let me mention the ratio in which I want to divide the data into training and testing. So the ratio that I'll mention is 0 0.2. Okay, fine. Now there are multiple issues that could arise in train test split. Okay, there are multiple issues that could arise. So the first issue uh, that could arise, let me show you that issue. What issues that could arise in train test split? Okay, let me show you those issues. So as I mentioned, guys, the selection of rows into training and testing will be random. So you will mention the ratio in which you would want to divide the data into training and testing. You might mention that, OK, I want 80% of the rows in training data set, the remaining 20% in testing data set. You will mention the ratio, but the selection of rows into training and testing will be done randomly. OK, selection of rows into training and testing. will be done randomly. Now, because of this, what is the issue that we'll face? Let's try to understand it. Okay, so now uh, remember, uh, let me ask you a question, guys. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask it to Deepak. Deepak, if I'm training you, does the number of examples matter? That the more examples I give to you, the better your understanding will be. Is it like that? Does the number of examples matter? Yes, right, it does matter. Then same applies to the model also. To the model also, the more examples you give for training, the better the model will be. Okay. What do I mean by examples? The rows in the training data set are called, are treated as examples for the model. So the more rows you pass in the training data set, the more examples you have in the training data set, the better it will be for the model. Okay. My second question to you, Deepak, is apart from number of examples, does the quality of examples also matter? That if I pass good, if I give you good examples, you will understand well. If I give you bad examples, your understanding will be bad, right? So yes, the quality of example also matters. Then same applies to the model. Okay, if you pass good quality rows in the training data set, the performance of the model will be good. If you pass bad quality rows in the training data set, then performance will be bad. What do I mean by good quality rows and bad quality rows? Okay, or good quality examples, bad quality examples. Let me. Uh, explain it to you with the help of an analogy. So let's suppose Deepak, you are the principal of a school and you are the one responsible for creating benches for first standard students. Okay, you are the one responsible for creating benches for first standard students. So what Deepak you have uh, thought, uh, what you have thought is that why don't you survey the height of first standard students, get information about the average height, and using that information, you will give the order to the carpenter that, okay, create a bench of this particular height. Okay. So you have gone to first standard students and you are trying to survey their heights. So let's suppose the uh, one student had a height of 2.2 feet. Okay. After that, the other student had a height of 2.15 feet. The next student had a height of 2.18 feet. The fourth student had a height of seven feet and the fifth student had a height of 7.5 feet. So Deepak, can I say that the fourth and fifth students over here are odd men out 
or outliers can i say that they are outliers right having a height of 7 feet in first standard is very rare okay usually in first standards the students are of shorter height okay having a person whose height is 7 feet and that person coming in first standard is rare so these students the fourth and fifth students are outliers okay now if you have these outliers in your data set and if you include them in your calculation then it will have a negative impact in your calculation how let me prove that to you so what deepak is thinking is he is a principal of a school he wants to design benches for first standard students so he is thinking that okay he will survey the height of first standard students and based on the average height of first standard students he will give the appropriate order to the carpenter so he is calculating the average let's calculate the average okay he is calculating the average over here and on calculating the average he has found out that the average height of first standard students is equal to 4.2 feet okay so the average height has come up to 4.2 feet so deepak will give this order to the carpenter that create a bench uh, assuming that average height is 4.2 feet but deepak because of this order that you have given can i say the first three students of your class will suffer because this bench that you are designing will be slightly higher for them slightly bigger for them can i say that yes right they will suffer so the point that i am making is if you include outliers in your calculation it will have a negative impact in your calculation then same applies to the model in a model what is happening behind the scenes some mathematical calculation is taking place right so if you include outliers in your uh, training data set also then it will have a negative impact in the uh, training okay so it will have a negative impact okay fine so now you are understanding that okay if you have outlier values then those rows will be called bad rows because they will have a bad effect on the calculation okay so if you have rows having outlier values they will be called bad rows okay so let's suppose you have a data in that data let's suppose uh, the first three rows are good rows and the remaining two rows have outlier values in them so let's suppose they are bad rows okay because rows with outlier values will have a negative impact on the calculation okay fine so let's suppose okay rows uh, okay let me include third row here okay so let's suppose we have six rows and what we are doing is 50% of the rows i want in training the remaining 50% i want in testing okay so uh, you are although the selection of rows into training and testing is random but what might happen is it might happen that the first 50% of the rows might be selected in training data set and the remaining 50% might be selected in testing data set okay now the model is correctly currently trained on three rows or three examples if you have a look at their color i have colored them in green that means all these three rows are good rows so if the model trains on good rows the model's performance will be good okay so let's say uh, over your uh, you trained on good rows so the performance of the model was very good and you got 99% accuracy okay so you are very happy you call your boss and you ask i tell your boss that okay i have created this model and it's giving me 99% accuracy so you, so your so your boss tells you that okay come to the office the next day and show me the model so you go to the office the next day okay and run the code of train test split again in front of your boss but guys can i say tomorrow when i go in front of my boss and run the code of train test split is it possible that tomorrow i might have different rows in training and testing possible or not that tomorrow when i go in front of my boss and i run my code of doing train test split then tomorrow i might have different rows in training and testing because selection of rows in training and testing is random okay so yes you wanted 50% of the rows in training 50% in testing that will happen but the selection of rows will be random okay so it might happen that this time the last three rows are selected in training and the remaining in testing now you can see the model is being trained on three rows or three examples majority of the examples over here are bad examples 
okay they are bad rows as colored in red color they are bad rows they might have outlier values in them okay so i'll call those rows bad rows okay so if the model is being trained on bad rows the model's performance will be bad so let's say tomorrow in front of your boss suddenly the accuracy of the model has come up come out to be around let's say 55% so your boss is very unhappy with you he will say are you fooling me or what yesterday you told me the model was giving 99% accuracy now in front of me is uh, giving 55% okay so it's not that you are fooling your boss okay you are not doing any mischief so why did this difference in accuracy come the difference in accuracy came because yesterday you had different rows in training and testing data set and today you are having different rows in training and testing data set so what i want is i want that yesterday whatever rows i had in training and testing data set today also i have same rows okay for reproducibility purpose see in a office setup what you will do is you will probably work in a developer team you will develop a model then you will give the model to the testing team for testing purpose and you will tell the testing team that okay this model is giving so and so accuracy but the testing team will run the code in their own laptop and at that time it should not occur that the testing team is getting a different accuracy so what you want is that whatever rows you have selected in training and testing the same rows testing team also uses in uh, selecting training and testing for reproducibility purpose okay so in order to have that reproducibility we will use a python concept called seeding okay we will use a python concept called seeding let's go ahead and let's understand how that works okay we'll use this python concept called seeding so the idea is that if we have a garden and if we plant a tomato seed then every time only tomato will come out of it right it's not that if you will plant a uh, plant a tomato seed an apple will come out of it no if you plant a tomato seed then only tomato will come out of it same concept is used over here and this python concept called seeding so let's suppose i am writing code to generate random values you can see every time it is generating different random value right but now let me introduce this concept of seeding okay so remember the seed value that you are passing should be a positive number and it should be a number without decimal so you guys give me any positive number uh, just remember that whatever number that you are giving should be positive and it should be a number without decimal give me any number of your choice it's up to you any number of your choice deepak has given me a number of 23 so i'll pass 23 now have a look deepak the random value that it is generated with this seed is it the same random number every time deepak are we getting the same random number generated yes or no yes right so this is the concept of seeding in python okay it's used to make sure that okay whatever random value you are generating uh, then with the seeding uh, concept you will get the same random value generated every time okay the same concept i will apply it over here okay so i'll pass that seed value to this parameter called random state okay so let me pass a seed value as deepak mentioned you can pass uh, any seed value okay uh, deepak mentioned a seed value of 23 if you want to pass a different seed value you can do that just remember that whatever seed value you are passing it should be uh, positive and it should be without decimal okay uh, so your the idea is that if i am using a random state of 10 and if my testing team in my company is also using a random state of 10 then me and my testing team will have the same set of rows in training and testing so here the seeding concept is just used for reproducibility purpose okay to reproduce the exact same output all right so one problem had arisen in train test split okay and we saw a solution to that problem now there is another problem that will arise in train test split but before seeing that we'll take a short break as you have learned as it's been one and a half hours and you are continuously learning so let's take a short break but guys up till now is it making sense to everyone since you guys requested before working with the ai 102 curriculum which is all about working with ready made ai models since you guys mentioned it will be better for you to understand how to create a custom ai model also we are doing that and this ai model we have created using a machine learning algorithm we, we are going to create we have not created it up till now but we are going to create it using a machine learning algorithm called multinomial naive base 
that algorithm that you just studied multinomial naive bayes was a machine learning algorithm okay fine oh i hope up till now it's making sense i can see some consternation in the chat all right so let's take a short break guys we'll come back after the break and then we'll continue our learning journey so let's take a break of around uh 15 minutes okay and then we'll come back after the break i'll just restart the timer to 15 minutes okay so we'll just come back after the break guys till then i'll be on mute
हेलो हाय एम आई ऑडिबल टू एवरी वन हेलो यस विवेक uh yes yes uh, hi everyone uh, my name is vivek uh, and i handle inside sales at synergetics okay uh, so i just wanted to quickly update you guys on a special batch we are setting up for uh, the course ai 102 uh the webinar today is of uh, actually 5 to 6 hours but the but the actual course uh, the duration of the actual course is 4 uh, days and we are offering you the training for it at just 2000 rupees which otherwise would cost you 14000 uh this batch is only limited to 25 people so the only uh, so the so the first 25 people who, uh, who gets in touch with me would be eligible for the batch uh so archie will share with you my details uh, my contact details my whatsapp number my email on the chat box anyone who is interested can uh, get in touch with me yeah that's it from me thank you
welcome back to the session everyone hope all of you guys are back after the break just give me a confirmation in the chat so that we can move forward is everyone back good to resume just give me a confirmation in the chat yes deepak okay fine so guys we were into a step number 5 let's try to resume from there so uh, step number 5 was to split the data set into two parts training and testing now we saw one problem that could arise in train test split and we saw a solution to that problem which can be implemented using the seeding concept now there is another problem that will arise in train test split let's see a solution of that problem as well okay so there is another problem that will arise in train test split what is that problem let's see so let's suppose i have a target column with me and in that target column i am mentioning uh, whether i was able to find a mars planet or not so let's say i have a telescope at my home and every night i am trying to look for a mars planet okay so let's suppose on the first day you did not find a mars planet okay you are not able to find it on the second day also you are not able to find it on the third day also you are not able to find it on the fourth day also you are not able to find it but on the fifth day you were able to find a mars planet on the sixth day you were able to find a mars planet on the seventh day you were able to find it similarly on the eighth day also you were able to find it so let's suppose i have a target column like this okay and i want to divide this into training and testing so let's suppose what i want to do is 50% of the rows that means four rows i want in training and the remaining 50% of the rows that means the remaining four rows i want in testing okay fine we know the selection of rows into training and testing will be done randomly but it's possible that in random selection what might happen is the uh first uh four rows might go into training and the remaining four rows might go into testing so currently my model is being trained on four rows in the training data set or in other words my model is being trained on four examples of the training data set okay i have a question for you now in any of the examples of the training data set remember i am uh, training my model on four examples so in any of the examples of the training data set is there even a single example where the planet is a mars planet in any of the examples of the training data set is there even a single example where the planet is a mars planet is there even a single example guys in the training data set no right so here in none of the examples of my training data set do we have a example where the planet is equal to mars so how will the model know that such a planet exists it will not know that see it's like this guys you and me only know those things on which we were trained right whether we are trained on it in a school time or college time or real life or office life or from the internet or from tv but you and me only know those things on which we are trained similarly the model will also only know those things on which the model is trained currently the model is being trained on four rows or four examples in none of the examples over here in the training data set do we even have a single example where the planet is equal to mars so that is why the model won't know that such a target value equal to mars exists because in the training data set there is not even a single example where target value is equal to mars so my model will not know that such a target value equal to mars exists if it does not know that it exists how will it predict it it will never be able to predict on it okay if it doesn't know that it exists forget prediction prediction uh, on target value equal to mars will never happen because it doesn't even know that such a target value called mars exists so how will it predict it it will never predict it okay so to solve this problem we have a concept called stratification okay let's see what that concept mentions okay stratification says that the proportion of target values proportion of target values present in original target column proportion of target values present in original target column should be similar to proportion of target values should be similar to proportion of target values present in training and testing data set okay 
so let's understand this okay so guys i have a question for you here in my original target column there are two unique values mars and not mars what is their proportion dharampal siddiqui kuldeep can you uh, mention the proportion there are two unique values in the target column mars and not mars what is their proportion in the original target column 50 50% right as dharampal mentions so the value not mars is occurring 50% of the times the value mars is also occurring 50% of the times okay so what stratification says is that since in the original target column the values mars and not mars are occurring 50 50% of the times that is why in the training data set also mars and not mars should occur 50 50% in testing data set also mars and not mars should occur 50 50% okay let's understand so now what i will do is i want four rows in training four rows in testing okay uh we know the selection of rows into training and testing will be random but apart from satisfying the train test split ratio i will also satisfy the stratification ratio let's see so this time what might happen is i, I might have these four rows into training okay, i might have these four rows into training let me mention the row values that i selected in training and the remaining rows will obviously be in testing okay and the remaining rows will obviously be in testing let me mention the values that i selected to be present in my testing data set okay now let's see so guys we wanted four rows in training four rows in testing that has been done okay so my train test split ratio has been satisfied what about my stratification ratio as per stratification if in the original target column the values mars and not mars were occurring 50 50% then in training data set also it should occur 50 50% in testing data set also it should occur 50 50% let's see whether that has been done now if you have a look guys in the training data set if you observe the values mars and not mars were occurring 50 50% even in the testing data set if you observe the values mars and not mars were occurring 50 50% so even the stratification ratio has been achieved now because of this did we solve our problem or not earlier our problem was that in the training data set there was not even a single example where the target value was equal to mars because of which the model did not know that such a target value exists if it does not know that such a target value exists how will it predict it it will never be able to predict it okay so now let's see now in the training data set you are giving four examples again but in the examples you are passing enough example uh, okay in the examples you have enough representation of both the type of target values mars and not mars both so now since in the examples you are giving enough representation of both the type of target values mars and not mars your model will be aware about both the type of target values if it is aware about both the type of target values it will be able to do prediction on both the type of target values okay so now the problem that we had before has been solved through this technique called stratification so let me apply that technique so i'll just mention in my code that i want to apply stratification okay but stratification needs to be applied where it needs to be applied on my target column okay stratification needs to be applied on my target column so let me go ahead and let me apply stratification on my target column over here okay that's it with this the train test split function will do its work first it will split the features into two parts so we will get feature train and feature test then it will split the target into two parts so you will get target train and target test okay fine with this step number 5 has been done now step number 6 is to make sure that features are should be on the same scale that means they should have same range of values it should not happen that okay if we have two feature columns let's say rating and score we know rating values might be between 1 to 5 whereas uh, score values might be between 1 to 100 so here these two feature columns have different range of values or they have different scale okay so if this is the case then what will happen is a feature column that has higher range of values will dominate the column having lower range of values but dominate what it will dominate calculation of distance okay uh, 
so up till now we have not seen any machine learning algorithm that does that okay that uh, has calculation of distance we have only seen one machine learning algorithm which was multinomial naive base and that did not involve any distance calculation whatsoever that's why step number 6 for this machine learning algorithm called multinomial naive base will be ignored so step number 6 i will ignore it for my current algorithm okay fine let me go ahead and let me move on to another step step number 7 step number 7 is to make sure that we train the model on the training data set so let's go ahead let's train the model on the training data set so for that uh, in order to train a model in order to create a model uh, what is a model uh, by the way it's a statistical representation of a real world process so in order to create a model you can create uh, you can develop your own statistical algorithm or you can use some statistical algorithm available in the market let me use a statistical algorithm available in the market called multinomial naive base so i will import the python class to implement that algorithm from sklearn folder there is a file called naive base from that file i will import this class called multinomial nb okay multinomial nb this is the class that i will import now i will call the class with this what will happen is the algorithm will be ready to train okay with this code currently i am not training the model it's just that i am making the algorithm ready so that it can train itself okay now that the algorithm is ready i will ask it to train how will i ask it to train let's suppose i want to train on my textbook then i will scan the contents in the textbook right similarly if i want my model to train then i will want my model to scan something okay another word for scanning in machine learning is called fitting so i would want it to apply fitting or i, I would want it to apply scanning scanning on what scanning on the training data set so out of the four things that you got in train test split which things belong to your training data set feature train and target train belongs to your training data set so i'll just take these two things that belong to my training data set and pass it to the model so that the model can train on it okay it got trained in one second because the training data set was very small in size okay total i have around 400 rows out of which 20% of the rows went into testing that means uh, 20% of 8 400 is 80 so 80 rows would have gone in testing and the remaining 320 rows would have gone in training so in my training data set i have very less number of rows 320 rows so that's why the model training was done in less than 1 second if you have more data in training data set then the training will take more time okay fine with this step number 7 has been done moving on to step number 8 now which is to test the model on the testing data set so let's test the model so i'll use the score method to test the model we need to test the model on the testing data set out of the four things that i got out of train test split which things belong to testing data set feature test and target test belong to testing data set so i'll just pass it to the model over here i'll just pass it to the model and with this step number 8 will be done i'll get a accuracy score at the end accuracy is nothing but number of correct predictions number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions okay divided by total number of predictions so let's suppose in the testing data set i had 80 rows so it will do predictions on all those 80 rows let's say out of those 80 rows 76 rows were correctly predicted so my accuracy will be 0.9 in percentage terms it will be 90% okay so accuracy is nothing but number of correct predictions divided by total number of predictions here the accuracy turns out to be around 0.925 okay in percentage terms we can say around 92% accurate for a model to be acceptable its accuracy should at least be greater than or equal to 0.7 here this is uh, definitely your acceptable model okay fine so we have built a model but why did we build it for time pass no right a model is created to get inferences through predictions okay so let me generate predictions so that from those predictions i can infer something okay let me generate predictions so let's suppose um i have a tweet on which i want to predict i want to predict whether that tweet has been written by donald trump or justin trudeau okay so let's suppose i have a tweet saying cnn is fake news okay let's suppose i have a tweet like this now guys if you follow geopolitics you would know this who is more likely to make this tweet is it going to be donald trump or is it going to be justin trudeau who is more likely to make this tweet 
Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau? If you follow geopolitics, you would know that Donald Trump is more likely to make it. Even I think he had made this tweet. It, it had got viral many years back. Okay, so Donald Trump is more likely to make this tweet. Let's see if my model also thinks the same or not. Okay, so now I will go ahead and make predictions. But before we do predictions, there are two points that you need to satisfy. So what are those two points? Point number one is that same changes that were applied on the features, same needs to be implemented on the data that I want to predict on. Okay, on the data that I want to predict on. Second important point is that the number of columns in features should match. Okay, the number of columns in features should be should match with number of columns in the data that I want to predict on. Okay, in the data that I want to predict on. Okay, fine. So let's take care of these two points. First point is that same changes that were applied on the features, same needs to be applied on the data that I want to predict on. So guys, on my feature column, what changes I had done? Let's see. So I got my feature column over here. After this, any change in its values? Here, any change in its values? No. What about count vectorizer? There, do we do a change in the feature values? Yes. Count vectorizer converts non-numeric feature values to numeric feature values, right? So count vectorizer does do a change in feature values. So since my features had gone through count vectorizer, that's why this data that I want to predict on will also go through count vectorizer. Let me apply count vectorizer on it. Okay. After count vectorizer, any other change done in its values? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Let me check though. Uh, after count vectorizer, so count vectorizer was done over here. Okay. After this, here any change in values? No. What about in splitting? Do we do a change in feature values? No. We just split the values, but no change in feature values is done. Okay, um, fine. You can see. So count vectorizer was the only change that we had done on features. That's why the same change we applied on the data that I want to predict on. Second point is to check the, that the number of columns in features matches with the number of columns in the data that I want to predict on. The number of columns in my features is 2528. And in the data that I want to predict on, there also the number of columns will be 2528. Okay, so it's matching. Now I can go ahead and ask the model to make prediction. So I'll ask it to make prediction. Uh, I, I feel that this tweet is more likely to be made by Donald Trump. Let's see whether that's the case. My model also thinks that it's more likely to be made by Donald Trump. Let me do one thing. Let me go ahead and let me take a real tweet. Okay. Let me take a tweet this time from Justin Trudeau's account. I'll take a tweet from Justin Trudeau's account. Okay, let me take this tweet. Okay, or let me take a tweet in a French language just to make it a bit more interesting. Guys, if you look at our data, I have some tweets in French language also. Okay, so my data does have tweet in French language. Hopefully it got trained on it. Okay, so let's pass a French tweet. Okay, I'll pass a fr French tweet over here. This tweet was made by uh, Justin Trudeau. Let's see uh, if uh, my model also thinks the same or not. Okay, here I'll just go ahead and ask it to make prediction. You can see my model says that this tweet has been made by Justin Trudeau. Okay, but is this a model that I can, uh, is this a production level model that I can sell to my client? No. This is a very basic model, okay? Um, uh, it's it's going to be prone to do mispredictions as well. Fine, up till now it has been doing predictions correctly, but uh, it can do mispredictions as well. Uh, there are two reasons for that. One reason is that I have trained it on very less number of rows. Out of 400 rows in my data, 320 rows had gone to training data set. So my model only trained on 320 rows. In real world, we usually train our model on thousands of rows. The more rows you pass in the training data set, the better your model will be. So one reason uh, why I say that this model is not that good 
is because I've only trained it on uh, I've trained it on less number of rows. Second reason is that the algorithm that I've applied is multinomial naive base. Okay, and it's a very old algorithm. There are much better algorithms that have been developed uh, that can give you much better performance than multinomial naive base. Okay. Uh, so these are the two main reasons why I feel that the model is not that good. I it's not a production level model that I can sell to my client. Fine, fine. Up till now it has been doing well. Okay. Um, but uh, it is going to be prone to mispredictions as well. Okay. Uh, now let me do one thing. Let me increase the accuracy of the model a little. Okay. Now to increase the accuracy, what will I do? In order to make you understand what I will do. Uh, I want to ask a question to you. Okay, so guys, let's suppose I uh, teach you. I give you 10, 10 examples. Out of the 10 examples. Okay, let's say two examples were bad. Can I say because of that your overall impression of my training will go down and you will have more doubts in that concept? Yes or no? That let's say for a particular concept, I gave you 10 examples. Out of 10 examples, two examples were bad. Can I say your overall impression of the training will go down because of those bad examples? Yes or no? And you will be confused. Hungering or not? Won't you be confused? Won't you be confused? If let's say I'm giving you 10 examples, out of those two were bad. It didn't make sense to you at all. You will be confused that, okay, you have not fully understood that concept. Okay, because the examples that I gave you were bad, right? You will be confused. Okay, the same applies to the model. Okay, so here what I will do is I'll do one thing. Um, what I will do is um, this time I will make sure that uh, whatever feature columns I'm passing are good feature columns. We know what count vectorizer does for every unique word, it creates a new feature column, right? Um, so let's uh, improve the feature columns a bit. What will I do? Let's see. So I want to ask a question to you. If you see words like this called is, a, the, and, do you think, okay, do you think these words will help you to predict whether a tweet has been made by Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau? Will these words, just by looking at these, I mean, if you just look at these words, do you think these words will help you to predict whether a tweet has been made by Trump or Trudeau? No, right? These are common words. I mean, these words could be used by Trump as well. These words could be used by Trudeau as well. Whereas if you have some words like, let's say, America. Yes, Trump is more likely to tweet about America. If you have a word like Canada. Yes, Trump, uh, Trudeau is more likely to tweet about Canada. But if you have these words like is, or uh, the... These are common words. These words, I don't think will help you to predict if a word is made by Donald Trump or Justin Trudeau. So what I'll say to my count vectorizer is, if you ever see common words in English language, do not create a new column. Do not create a new feature column for it. Because I don't think that feature column is going to help me for prediction. So if you ever see common words in English language, do not create a new feature column for it. Okay. And now let's see what will happen because of that. Now you will get less number of feature columns. Previously, you had somewhere around 2,500 feature columns. Now you will see comparatively less number of feature columns. Have a look. Okay, previously you had 2,500 feature columns. Now have a look. You can see the number has reduced. Now you have around 2,300 feature columns. Okay, so now what we are doing is we are only keeping the feature columns that I feel would be beneficial for prediction. Okay, because feature columns are those columns that help me for prediction. So if at all there are columns that I feel will not help, it's better to remove them. And let's see whether that will have an impact on the model performance or not. Guys, previously the accuracy of my model was 0 0.925. Now let's see the accuracy. Now guys, you can see the accuracy has increased. It has improved to 0 0.9375. So this proves that if at all you have a column that is not worthy to become a feature, remove that column. Otherwise, it will have a negative impact on the model performance. The model might be confused. Okay. Fine. There are multiple things that you can do uh, to improve the model performance. One thing is improve the data on which it, you are training on. Improve the columns. Improve the rows. Okay. That's one thing. So improve the data on which you are training on. Second is improve the algorithm. 
that you are using for training. So two main things you can do to improve performance. With this, we have learned how to make an AI model. Obviously, we have created it using the machine learning approach. Similarly, somebody could use the deep learning approach as well. Okay. Uh, I won't show you the mathematics behind the deep learning approach since we have less time in our uh, lecture today. Okay. Uh, but I hope this made sense to you. Since you guys had requested that it will be better for you to understand how to create an AI model from scratch, I showed you how to do it. But coming now to our AI 102 curriculum, which is what you are gathered here for. Guys, in AI 102, you are not expected to create custom AI models. No. Azure has created ready made AI models for you, and all you are supposed to do is just use those ready made AI models. Okay. So Azure has created multiple AI models, and it has divided it into nine categories or nine services. Let me explain those categories to you, or let me explain those services to you. One service is document intelligence service, which you can use to scan documents and extract information out of it. Let's suppose you are working as a banker in one of the banks. Okay. And your job is to open bank accounts of customers. So as a banker, what you will do, you will ask the customer to provide you the pan card and other card. And based on that, you will fill in the details in your computer and open the bank account for that customer. Okay. So let me take an example. Siddiqui. Let's suppose you are working as a banker in HDFC bank and your job is to open bank accounts of customers. So you will ask uh, the customers to provide you PAN card, other card. You will go through the PAN card and other card, take the details from it, put it in your computer. And that's how you will open the bank account for that customer. But Siddiqui, let's say in a day, 10,000 people come to you to open their bank account. Okay, let's say in one day, 10,000 people come to you to open their bank account. And you are supposed to go through their Aadhaar cards and PAN cards of all those 10,000 people. Okay, in a day. Can I say, Siddiqui, you will be, uh, uh, it will be difficult for you to uh, go through all those documents of those 10,000 people. Yes or no? It will be difficult for you to go through it manually. Agreed or not? Agreed or not, guys? Yes, right? Instead, why don't you have a, a why don't you use an AI model that is going to scan those documents for you? Okay, you can pass any number of documents. Okay, 10,000 documents, 1 lakh documents. It will scan those documents and whatever information you want to extract from those documents, you will extract from it. So, for example, if you ask, uh, let's say you're passing invoice documents and you are asking your AI model to scan it, and then you are asking the AI model, okay, that give me the invoice number mentioned in. Uh, first invoice. Give me the invoice number mentioned in second invoice. Or uh, you might ask that, okay, give me the address mentioned in 10th invoice. Give me the uh, amount uh, mentioned in 44th invoice. Okay. It will, the AI model will do that for you. So the document intelligence service has AI models that will scan the documents for you and um, uh, it will extract information from it. Okay, so for different different documents, Azure has created different different AI models for working with PAN card, other card document. There is a different AI model for working with invoices. There is a different AI model for working with marriage certificate documents. There is a different AI model and so on. Okay, we'll see a demo of it today. Then the next service is language service, which you can use to analyze text. So let's suppose uh, you have a cloud kitchen on Zomato. Okay. And you are running a cloud kitchen through which people can buy your food items. But once they buy their, uh, your food item, then you can go ahead and uh, 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 customers can leave their reviews on your cloud kitchen, right? That whether the food was bad, good, or whatever. Okay. So let's suppose uh, you have working on a cloud, uh, you have a cloud kitchen that you have on Zomato through which you are selling food items. And customers are leaving reviews on it. Okay. So what you are thinking is uh, you want to analyze those reviews. Maybe customers have left thousands of reviews, but now if suddenly you have an urge to analyze that. Okay, maybe some reviews are written in different different languages. Some reviews could be written in Marathi language, some could be written in Kannada language, some could be written in Hindi language, some could be written in English language. You still want to analyze those text reviews. Well, you can come to language service and pass your text. And it will analyze that text for you, okay, um, at a much faster rate, which much more efficiency. 
okay there are multiple things that you can do in analysis sentiment analysis is one uh, entity recognition analysis is other and so on okay so you can go ahead and analyze text similarly you can go ahead and uh, ask the language service to create conversational chatbots okay let's suppose you have a website similar to lg.com if you have a look guys in lg.com they have a chatbot integrated into it okay if you see they have a chatbot integrated into it and i can interact with the chatbot let's say my ac is not working okay so i will ask the chatbot that my ac is not working and it will give me some answer okay so let's suppose you want to create a similar chatbot but you do not have programming experience no need to worry just go to azure ask it to create the chatbot for you no code required whatsoever not a single line of code is required and azure will create that um, um, uh, chatbot for you and you can then integrate it into your website okay and you can then integrate it into your website fine all right so that was about language service then coming to vision service so guys you can use vision service to analyze images and analyze videos okay analyze images and analyze videos so here you have ready made ai models that you can use to analyze images and analyze videos then you have another service called speech service which you can use to translate speech from one language to another so let's suppose there is a bilateral meeting going on between our prime minister mr modi and uh, head of russia mr putin now whenever these two head of countries meet if you have observed what they do is they always have a ear piece in their ear because putin would speak in russian language modi would speak in hindi language we know to understand what modi is speaking putin will try to translate hindi to russian similarly now to understand what putin is speaking modi will try to translate it from russian to hindi so some translator is trying to speak in that ear piece right that's how these leaders are coming to know what that other person is speaking so what if that trans uh, speech translation you want to do in real time with a much better efficiency well you can go ahead and come to speech service use the ai models of the speech service to translate speech from one language to another okay so if i want to translate it from hindi to punjabi from english to russian whatever okay the multiple languages that are supported then coming to the next service which is translator service so guys you can use the translator service to translate your text from one language to another so let's suppose you have written a book in hindi language but now you want to sell it in other countries so you are thinking to sell it in china japan england okay but if you sell it in the same hindi language maybe people won't buy it so you are thinking that you will translate your book in different languages and then sell it so in order to sell it in china first you will translate your book in chinese language and then sell it in chinese language uh, in order to sell it in japan you will sell uh, you will translate your book in japanese language and then sell it in japan and so on so maybe you can hire a translator who can translate your book in different languages but at the end the translator is a human he or she can do mistakes okay and obviously it will take the translator a lot of time okay so what if you want to do this text translation with much better speed and which much better efficiency you can come to translator service and it will translate your speech from one language to another coming to content safety service which you can use to make sure that whatever text and images that you are receiving are not offensive so let's suppose you are running a social media website like twitter okay and you want to employ a filter so that nobody uh, uploads any offensive text or nobody uploads any offensive images okay so well you can come to content safety service use the ai models of content safety service that will make sure that whatever text or images that are being received are not offensive okay if at all there is some offensive thing in it it will Uh, flag those things for you. Fine. Then coming to search service. So guys, search service will help us to analyze text and analyze images. Now you might tell me that Smith, in order to analyze text, I had language service as well, right? And in order to analyze images, I had vision service as well. So what does search service do differently? Okay. But uh, before doing, before mentioning what it does differently, remember. that yes i mentioned that search service will analyze text and it will analyze images but it does not have its own ai model to do that in order to analyze text it will use the ai model of language service in order to analyze images it will use the ai model of vision service it's just that 
after doing the analysis whatever is the analysis data that analysis data it will organize with help of index okay that analysis data will be organized with help of indexes what do indexes do so guys in your school time you might have worked with notebooks right and in the front page of the notebook there used to have a index what it used to do it used it it was helping you to find information faster so if your teacher came to you and asked you to open chapter number 10 from the index you came to know that okay chapter number 10 is at so and so page so you directly opened that page right so the purpose of index was to find information faster okay similarly over here uh, in search service index is used for the same exact purpose so whatever is the analysis data it will be organized with help of index and uh, organizing it with the help of index will help me to search information faster okay then coming to next service which is azure open ai service okay so guys if you don't know there is a tie up between open ai company and azure company open ai company is the one that has made chat gpt product okay so open ai company and azure company have made a tie up and what they have done is uh, whatever uh, models open ai is going to create it is going to make it available on azure as well okay so uh, all those models of open ai like gpt 3.5 gpt 4 dal e all these models you will be able to see um, in this open ai service okay so they have made open ai company and azure company have made a tie up so whatever models open ai will create it will make it available on azure as well okay so uh, then azure got an idea that okay why don't we try to replicate same models that open ai is making okay so for example if open ai has made a model to uh, summarize text so azure is also trying to create same models okay but these are small language models whereas open ai usually creates large language models large language models are nothing but models that are all rounders okay for example if you have ever used chat gpt behind the scenes a llm model is being used a large language model is being used which are all rounders it you can use it to translate text summarize text many things you can do okay but then people complained that large language models are having more cost okay so people were complaining to azure that okay large language models are having more cost uh, i don't want to use all the features of large language model i just want to use one feature so large language model is costing me a lot so it's like this for example deepak let's suppose deepak you are the ceo of a company and you want to hire a backend developer okay you want to hire a backend developer so there are two candidates in front of you one candidate knows front end and back end both another candidate the second candidate knows only backend. So, Deepak, my question to you is which candidate will be cheaper for you? Candidate one or candidate two? Which will be cheaper for you? Who will be cheaper? Can I say, guys, candidate two? Because he only knows backend. He only knows backend. Whereas candidate one knows front end and backend both. So he will demand more salary. He will say, no, I have this skill set. I can't work with less salary. Okay. So can I say that candidate two over here will be more cheaper because he is not an all-rounder. Okay. So even with less salary, he can do the job. Okay. Similarly, guys, small language models are made with the exact same intention. So small language models are not all-rounders. So because of that, what will happen is they will be much more cheaper. Okay. Whereas large language models are slightly more costlier okay so small language models are made for a specific purpose they are not all rounders they cannot do all the tasks they will be made for a specific purpose but um, the main advantage is that they will be more cheaper okay so guys in these services you have gen ai models now what is gen ai and how is it different as compared to ai let's try to understand Okay, let's try to understand it. So guys, what was the limitation of traditional AI because of which Gen AI had to be invented? There was a big limitation of traditional AI, whether you implement it by uh, machine learning approach or deep learning approach, there was a big limitation of traditional AI. 
and that limitation was with respect to target column that limitation was with respect to target column what is the limitation let's see so guys in traditional ai you could have a target column that was discrete in nature you could also have a target column that was continuous in nature discrete in nature means a column having finite set of possibilities continuous in nature means a column having infinite set of possibilities so you could have a target column that is discrete in nature or continuous in nature if it was discrete in nature then your target column could have numeric values as well as non numeric values okay numeric values as well as non numeric values an example of a discrete numeric target column is something like is something like let's say dice roll okay let's say i'm playing a game of dice with my friends whatever value i get after rolling the dice that value i'm storing it in this column so let's say when i'm first rolling the dice i get the value 1 then when i roll the dice again i get the value 6 again when i roll the dice i get the value 4 again when i roll the dice i get the value 6 and so on so let's suppose dice roll column is a target column obviously in this target column you have finite set of possibilities right you have only six possibilities so you have finite set of possibilities so this target column is discrete in nature and does it have numeric values or non numeric values you can see it as numeric values so dice roll target column is a example of a discrete numeric target column which is allowed in traditional ai okay let me give you an example of a discrete non numeric target column something like gender let's say i am mentioning the gender of every employee in my office okay let's say first employee in my office had a gender of male second employee in my office had a gender of female third employee in my office had a gender of female and so on so here you can see in gender column i have finite set of possibilities so gender uh, column if it is a target column then i'll call it a discrete target column and does it have numeric values or non numeric values you can see it as non numeric values so gender target column is a example of a discrete non numeric type of target column okay so you can have a discrete numeric column as a target column in traditional ai you can have a discrete non numeric column as a target column in traditional ai but what if your target column is of continuous nature then your target column could only have numeric values non numeric continuous type of target column is not allowed in traditional ai remember i am talking about target column over here not feature column okay so you can you are allowed to have continuous numeric type of target column but if you have a continuous non numeric type of target column that was not allowed in traditional ai let me give you an example of a continuous numeric target column so something like stock price let's say i'm mentioning the price of my stock after every day let's say on the first day it was 100.981 rupees on the next day it was 99.2 rupees and so on so your stock price column has infinite set of possibilities so if stock price column was my target column then my target column would have infinite set of possibilities so i will call this target column a continuous type of target column and does it have numeric values or non numeric values you can see it as numeric values so stock price is an example of a continuous numeric type of target column which is allowed in traditional ai however if you have a continuous non numeric type of target column something like youtube comments okay so let's suppose you want to predict that a person will write which youtube comment so let's say in the first row you have a youtube comment called hi and the second row somebody has mentioned hello and so on so you want to predict uh, the youtube comment made by a person so youtube comment is your target column now over here you can see in youtube comment column you have infinite set of possibilities so that means your target column has infinite set of possibilities so i'll call my target column a continuous type of target column and does it have numeric values or non numeric values it has non numeric values so having a continuous non numeric type of target column was not allowed in traditional ai okay but because of this limitation gen ai field was invented and it was invented for this exact same purpose to allow continuous non numeric type of target column guys if you have ever used chat gpt have a look at the output whatever output is it is generating it is nothing but the prediction made by the model okay so if you ever focus on the output made by chat gpt tool does it output continuous values as well deepak siddiqui others can you answer what about chat gpt tool does it does it output continuous values as well or does it only output fixed set of values finite set of values so guys chat gpt has a finite set of output 
or infinite set of output infinite right so it outputs continuous values and does it out i mean is it also capable of uh, uh, predicting or outputting uh, non numeric values yes right chat gpt does give you non numeric output okay so gen ai was invented just for this purpose because in traditional ai there was a limitation that continuous non numeric target column was not allowed in traditional ai that's why gen ai field was invented okay now behind these scenes what mathematics will work uh, we will not cover that in today's lecture because it's outside the scope of today's webinar but in some other webinar uh, if the topic comes we'll definitely cover that okay but i hope you have understood the limitation of traditional ai and when when why gen ai had to be invented okay fine now let's go ahead and what we'll do now is we'll move on to the second point in our agenda for today so i wanted to talk about speech service right so let's go ahead and let's talk about speech service uh, but before we do since we only have 20 minutes for each 1 pm I guess it will be better if we take a lunch break right now, and then after the lunch break we come back and we see demo of these services over here. Okay, but up till now, guys, is it making sense? The concepts are they making sense? Yes. All right. Fine. So let's take a lunch break, guys, because um, I don't want that I start with demo of speech service, then I stop in the middle. Because I'll have to give you lunch break in the in between also. Okay, so let's take a lunch break right now. We'll come back after the lunch break, then we'll start fresh and we'll see demo of each of these services. Okay. So I'll start the timer. And let's take a lunch break of one hour. We'll be back after one hour, please. Fine. Till then, I'll be on you. We'll just take a lunch break of one hour.
Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you guys are back after the break. Just give me a confirmation in the chat. Is everyone back? Good to resume. Just give me a confirmation in the chat. OK, I can see thumbs up from some people. OK. All right. So now that you guys are back, let's resume our session. So guys, we have understood what is AI. And as per your request, um, we have already, we have also seen how to create a custom AI model. Although in AI 102 curriculum, you are not required to create a custom AI model. Um, Azure has already created ready-made AI models for you and you are just supposed to use them. And that is what AI 102 curriculum is all about, using ready-made AI models that are available on Azure. Okay, so, so now that you have an understanding of what is AI, let's go ahead and let's see a demo of Azure speech service. So what I will do is, I will create a folder in my laptop. And uh, my demo will be mentioned in that folder. Let me create a folder over here. I'll call it webinar. November. 2024. All right. So now since I want to work with speech service guys, Let's go ahead and let's see how to do it. In Azure, there is a rule that whenever you want to work with any service of Azure, you have to go ahead and create a resource of that service. I repeat myself again. In Azure, there is a rule that whenever you want to create any service of Azure, you have to go ahead and create a resource of that service. So if I want to use the speech service, I will have to then go ahead and create a resource of that speech service. Let's do that. Let me try to search for speech service. I can see an option for it in my search results. Let me click on that option. And as I mentioned, since I want to use the speech service, I will first go ahead and create a resource of that speech service. So let me click on the create button to do that. I'll try to create a resource of speech service. Now, when I try to do that, I'm redirected to a form that I have to fill. So let me fill in the details of the form. The first field in this form is asking me to select subscription. Remember guys that in your Azure account, you can create more than one subscriptions for different, different people. So let's suppose you are the CEO of a company and you want to ensure that all the employees of a company have access to the Azure portal. So what you are thinking is why don't you create a subscription for every employee of a company? So let's suppose first subscription that you are creating is for a person in the HR team. The second subscription that you are creating is for a person in the IT team and so on. Like this, you can create many, many subscriptions. In each of those subscriptions, you can assign different amount of permissions. So for example, in the first subscription that you have created for a person in the HR team, now this HR person is not going to do a lot of work in Azure. Probably this HR person is only going to use Azure to store some files. So this HR person only requires access to storage service of Azure. So you will make sure that the subscription that you are creating for the HR person in that subscription, you only give access to the storage service. Okay. Whereas in the second subscription, the one that you are creating for the IT person, that IT person is going to do a lot of work in Azure. So for that person, you will make sure that you provide more access. Okay. So for the subscription that you are creating, uh, in the subscription that you are creating for the IT person, we will make sure that you assign more permissions. So the point that I'm making is for different subscriptions, you can assign different amount of permissions. Also, additionally, for every subscription, you can assign different amount of money into it. For example, the first subscription that you have created for a person in the HR team, since this HR person is not going to do a lot of work in Azure, that's why to this subscription that you have created for this HR person, you will upload less amount of money. Let's say something like $10. On the other hand, uh, the second subscription that you have created for a person in the IT team, this IT person is going to do a lot of work in Azure. So for this subscription, you will upload more amount of money. Let's say something like $2,000 and so on. So the point that I'm trying to make is from your Azure account, you can create different subscriptions, each having different set of permissions into it and each having different amount of money up uploaded into it. Okay, 
So in my scenario, I will choose MSDN subscription. Okay, this is the one that is given to be my Microsoft. Okay, since I'm a Microsoft certified trainer, this one, this subscription has been given to be my Microsoft. And what they do is uh, every month they upload hundred dollars worth of credits so that I can take my lectures on Azure. Okay, fine. So let me choose that subscription only MSDN subscription. Then I am being asked to select the resource group for my resource. So I'm creating a resource of speech service. So your Azure is asking me to put that resource in some of the other resource group. I can either create a new resource group or select an existing one. Let me create a new resource group and let me call it webinar RG, which stands for webinar resource group. Okay, fine. Now there are a lot of benefits of assigning a resource to a resource group. By the way, it's mandatory for you to assign a resource to some of the other resource group, but there are many benefits of doing that. Let's see the benefits. Okay, so let's suppose you are working on a project and for that project, you had to create 20 resources. Let's say one resource is that of speech service. Another resource is that of Azure SQL service. Another resource is that of Azure Cosmos DB service and so on. So suppose you had to create 20 different resources for your project. And now after six months, your project has ended. Okay, so now these resources are of no use for you. Since the project is over, now these resources of your project are of no use for you. So you are thinking to delete these resources so that no further cost is incurred. So one approach that you can do is uh, you can go to each resource one by one, click on the delete button to delete that resource manually. Okay, like that you can go into each of these 20 resources one by one and delete them manually. But it's a very tedious process, right? Instead, why don't we have these resources that belong to the same project inside the same exact resource group? Why don't we have these resources that belong to the same project inside the same exact resource group? And when the time for deletion comes, at that time I can directly go to my resource group, click on the delete button, with that, the entire resource group will get deleted. And if the resource group gets deleted, then all the resources in that resource group will automatically get deleted. So it's like if I if I delete a folder, then all the files in the folder automatically get deleted, right? Similarly, if I delete a resource group, then all the resources in that resource group will automatically get deleted. Okay, fine. So uh, one benefit of resource group is life cycle management. There are other benefits also. So let's suppose you are working in a project for which you had to create 20 resources again. Okay, let's suppose many resources that you had to create. Let's suppose you had to create 20 resources. Now you want to calculate the total cost incurred by your project. So one thing that you can do is you can check the cost uh, of every resource. So let's suppose the first resource charged you $5.11. The next resource charged you $100.9 and so on. So like this, you can calculate the cost incurred because of every resource. Then later you can go ahead and take the sum of all these costs. That's how you will arrive at total cost incurred by the project. But this is a very tedious task, checking the cost of every resource and then later taking the sum of it. Instead, why don't I have my resources that belong to the same project inside the same exact resource group? And when the time for cost calculation comes, at that time, I can directly go to my resource group and check the total cost of all the resources in that resource group just by a single click of the button. Okay, just by a single click of the button, I, I will be able to see the total cost of all the resources in that resource group. So this is the second benefit of resource group, which is cost management. First benefit was life cycle management. Second benefit is cost management. Like that, there are many benefits of assigning a resource to a resource group. In simple words, just remember that resource group helps you for better management of resources. Okay, fine. Let's move forward. Now I'm being asked to put my resource uh, to in some region of Azure. Okay, so in which server should it get deployed? Should it get deployed in a East US server or Central India server or Brazil South server? It's up to you to decide. Uh, just make sure that if you are creating this resource for a user, then make sure that the region that you select is closest to that user for better latency. So for example, if I'm creating my resource for someone in the United States, then I will choose a region closer to United States 
just for better latency. Uh, so you can select any region that you want. Uh, just a suggestion, guys. Avoid East US region. Um, since the last four to five months, there have been a lot of traffic issues related to East US region. So you let's suppose still you uh, want to go ahead and create a resource in East US region. Fine, create it. Create your speech resource in this East US region. But while trying to access that speech resource, you will encounter traffic related issues. There are high chances that you encounter traffic related issues. So avoid East US, just one suggestion. Apart from East US, choose any region that you like. Let me choose West US. OK, then after that, I'm I'm being asked to assign a name to my resource. So let me give it a name. I will call it webinar speech RES. After that, I'm being asked to choose the pricing tier for my resource. There are two pricing tiers available, free and standard. With free tier, I will not be charged for usage whatsoever. It will be free for use. OK, so that's the advantage of free tier, which is that it will be free for use. But the disadvantage is that there will be a lot of limitations with respect to usage. OK, so I'll only be able to use the resource for a certain number of times uh, uh, in a minute and so on. OK, so there will be limitations with respect to usage. Whereas in standard tier, you will be charged for usage. So it's not free with standard tier. You, have, you will have to pay some cost for usage. But the advantage of standard tier is that uh, many of those limitations of free tier will not exist in standard tier. OK, fine. So I'll choose standard tier. With that, I will have to pay some cost for usage, but that's fine for me. Now let me go ahead and let me click on review plus create button. With this, Azure will try to validate whether it can give me the things that I'm asking for. If the validation is successful, then the create button will be enabled. And now you can see the create button has been enabled. Let me click on it. And with this, a resource of speech service will be created for me. OK, now while this resource is getting created, let me address the doubts in the chat. Dharampal mentions, can you please share the notebook and the data that we used uh, in our earlier explanation? OK, let's see that. OK, I guess I'm not able to directly upload the files here in the chat. Uh, so I'll do one thing. Uh, I will create a separate Google Drive folder and um, upload my materials over there and then share you the link of Google Drive folder uh, by the end of today's session. OK. Uh, so I'll do that uh, by the end of today's session. You will receive the materials. Uh, then Siddiqui has a doubt. Siddiqui mentions these services are charged based on consumption. Yes, so based on consumption of the resource, you will be charged. If you use the resource one time, you will have to pay less cost. If you use the resource, let's say 100 times, more cost you have to pay. OK, so based on consumption, you will be charged. OK, so there are two type of charges. One is the resource creation charge that you will have to pay, but it's very minimal. OK. Uh, so there will be one charge that you have to pay uh, because you have created the resource because that resource will be deployed on some server of Azure. OK, so for occupying some space of that server, so some cost will be deducted, but that is a one time cost. Resource creation cost is a one time cost. Second cost is resource usage uh, usage cost. OK, and based on how many times you are using the resource based on uh, that, uh, additional cost will be incurred. So if you use it 10 times, slightly less cost you will have to pay. If you use it 20 times, slightly more cost you have to pay. OK, fine. So two costs you have to pay. First is resource creation cost, which is a one time cost. Second is resource usage cost, which is an incremental cost. Depending on how many times you use the resource, you will be charged that many times. But it's very minimal, guys. Um, usually I have observed that if I call my resource, like let's say, uh, around 10 times, hardly one rupee gets deducted. OK. Um, so I will also show the cost to you, what cost was incurred, uh, but it's very minimal. OK. Fine. Anyways, uh, I hope your doubts have been addressed. If not, let me know. Now let me go ahead and uh, let me go to the resource. OK, so now that I have created my resource of speed service, I will try to use that resource. There are two ways to use the resource. One is using the without code approach. Second is using the with code approach. In order to work with the without code approach, you can just click on this button called go to studio. 
and you will be able to interact with the speech resource without any code okay however i always prefer the second approach which is uh, to use the speech resource with code okay i always prefer the with code approach uh, as compared to the without code approach all right fine so let's see so what i'll do is i'll open a coding tool so that i can interact with my speech resource with code let me open a coding tool you can open any coding tool that you like here i'll open a coding tool called uh, uh, visual studio code okay so let me uh, create a new instance of this okay so here i have opened a coding tool called visual studio all right now let's go ahead i'll try to zoom in over here let me see if i am able to zoom in I'll just try to zoom in. It's control plus. Okay, fine. Okay, I've zoomed in now. All right. Now let me open the folder that I created for our batch. Okay, so I just created a folder called webinar November 2024, and this is the folder where I uh, I will make sure that all my coding files are present. All right. So now let's go ahead. So guys, currently I I have a coding file inside of my laptop. Okay, let's suppose I'll create a coding file. Let me create one for you. Um, in fact, you know, for better organization, let me create a subfolder over here. I'll call it speech, and within that subfolder, I'll create a coding file called test.py. Okay. So currently I have a coding file with me. Okay, that coding file is inside of my laptop. and i want to access the speech resource i want to access the speech resource which is available on azure so currently there is no link between my coding file and the speech resource so in order for my coding file to access the speech resource i will have to perform some authentication so let me do that let me perform that authentication now in order to perform that authentication i will require two things okay first is the key of the resource and second is the region in which the resource lies using these two things i will try to perform authentication to the speech resource so let's do that so the first thing that i will mention is the key of the resource now you might ask me that smith i can observe two keys over here which one should i use well you can use any one of them it's just that one extra key is given to you for backup purposes just like in our home two keys are available right one key is there for backup purposes so if anything happens to the first key you can use the second key at that point okay so let's suppose um you are using your key and that key um has been corrupted okay or it has been uh, not corrupted let's suppose let me take a simple example let's suppose it has been exposed okay your key has been exposed so now when if anybody has access to your key if anybody sees this key using the key they can access the speech resource okay they can access your speech resource so for them to not gain access what will you do so it's like this let's suppose you have exposed your credit card details then you will tell your bank to block that credit card right but till the time your credit card is blocked you won't be able to do any transactions with the credit card so wouldn't it be good if you had a backup credit card so that if anything is happening is happening to the primary credit card and while the issues of the primary credit card are sorted till that time you can use the backup credit card similarly over here two keys are available so if you feel that there are some issues with the first key it has been exposed you can regenerate the first key but till that point you can use the second key till then okay Fine. So you can use any one out of the keys. Doesn't matter. Let me use the second key over here. All right. So in order to gain authentication to the speech resource, I require two things. One is key of the resource, and second is the region in which the resource lies. So let me mention the region. So here the region is West US region. I'll just copy it and mention it in my coding file. All right. Using these two things, I'll try to authenticate to the 